Well, this morning we're going to talk about crowns. Uh, this was a topic that uh, somebody had made mention to me, and, and it really piqued my interest because, you know, I think I remember reading through Scripture about having a crown in heaven, and, and uh, we were just recently studying in James about this crown of life, and I'm like, well, what is this? What, what are these crowns? What is this thing that they're talking about? Are they real? Are they symbolic? And, uh, and when you dig into the Word, it, it's amazing what God reveals to us. Uh, but, you know, what I wanted to kind of start off with, let's go to the next slide. Let's look at our foundational verse that kind of sets the tone for this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, Paul writes very specifically about crowns and about a race that we are running and uh, that he talks about. So let's look right here. Verse 24, it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, uh, runners run but only one receives the prize? So run so that you may obtain it. Every athlete, athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. The challenge is this. I know many Christians who struggle with the idea of working toward or for God. There is this, this tension that lies within the church. Whenever you say working toward, there is a huge pushback upon many saying, ah, you shouldn't work for anything. It's all by grace that we receive everything from God. But that's not a balanced view of the Bible. There are plenty of calls for us to do action, to take action, to do things. That God wants us to strive for his, for his transformation, for His approval, for His love. He wants us to be working and continually focused on Him. But we've got to make sure we do it in the right way, a balanced way. And so this is what I kind of want to address when I'm talking about this. Let's look at this from a different point of view. Because there's a general confusion as to pursuing or striving for an achievement in church matters. There's a general concern about that. You know, if I, <clears throat> do I do this because I'm wanting to please God and, and am, am I working for this? You know, there, and there's a clear distinction between the church setting and the world, shall we say. Okay? In the world, there seems to be a very clear goal and an end point to aim towards. We have things that when we go to work, we know that we're looking towards possibly looking at, uh, uh, you go to work because there's a promotion or there's a possible raise or a position or an award that we can look for. And so it motivates us when we get to work to say, you know what, I want to achieve that next promotion or that next award or that next thing. And so it brings and motivates us in a setting where you may not just be motivated if you just go to work for a paycheck. If you're just going for a paycheck, your motivation to be at work and to help others, it starts to wane, right? When you're just looking and going, oh, because oftentimes we look at our paycheck and go, I did all that for that, <laughs> right? Sometimes the paycheck just doesn't motivate us enough. We need to have more intrinsic stuff that drives us forward. Well, I believe that God has this in the kingdom of heaven as well. He understands we're not motivated at work for no reason. God de de designed us. He created us with a motivation to want to achieve. Now, there's some of them that, you know, you look at the sports and there's a highly competitive event and that, that's, that's deep down. I don't think that's a whole worldly trait. I believe God has created that desire to compete and to move forward. And Paul uses the term, run the race. And when you run that weight race, run it to win it. We're not about participation trophies here. We're about <laughs> achievements and making accomplishments for God. Our accomplishments that we do within the church have eternal impact. Amen. And so, you know, for the church, we don't want to have a whole lot of competition because of, we do seek unity. You know, in the church setting, you don't see a whole lot of, you know, I want to hear you singing louder than the next person. I want to give you an award for doing that. Because we realize that when you do things in that shape of manner, form of motivation, that it gets a little awkward. It's a little awkward. So within the church setting, the desire to achieve or to do anything is an intrinsic drive that comes from your inside. You should be motivated from the inside to serve the Lord to come to church every Sunday. To do those other things. 
Yeah, my wife sat up here and she tried to motivate you to come to prayer, but you know what? The real motivation comes from inside going, I want to be there because I know I'm having an impact on God's kingdom. I need to be there because I want to be there because I'm serving something so much greater than I. And so as we look at these crowns, you know, we shouldn't manufacture something to get people to come, right, to, to, to do stuff. That's, that's not a good way. Understanding what Jesus Christ has done for us and achieved for us should be all the motivation in the world yes. for us to want to then be motivated forward. Yes. And so as we're looking at this topic of crowns, there's that fine balance of motivation. But I'm saying, let's face it, most people need to want something to achieve and strive for. We're designed to want to achieve and strive for a goal. And it seems to be a very core part of how we're designed. So it's clear as Paul was so motivated. I, Paul, I think, man, that, that boy, I would have hate to have been around him. I think everything was a competition for that guy. I really do. I think Paul was highly motivated and he wanted to compete. I mean, when he was serving people, he, was, he wasn't doing it haphazardly. He was achieving a goal. He saw it as a race. He used this metaphor quite often. But you know what? It's, he's not the only person that was like that. James, Peter, they all had these things deep down in. If you read their words and their, and their motivations, they were highly motivated as well. And so... Let's look back here. It is clear that Paul was motivated, and in Corinthians, this verse that we just read gives us the permission and encouragement to run the race and go to heaven and live to win. We don't live to survive. We don't live to, to get by. We are supposed to live to win for Christ, whatever that might be. And so let's go ahead and look forward here, but I want to do right now, let me take a moment and be careful. Go into the next slide. Now, when it comes to salvation, what I am preaching here does not apply in any shape, manner, or form. we got to be clear that earning crowns and all this stuff has nothing to do with us trying to earn or deserve our place in heaven because we cannot earn or deserve that. We can't do a thing to earn the salvation that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross as we get ready to come into Easter service. Do not think that you can work your way to salvation, and I want to be very clear about that. Because if we think that we can start doing good things and doing and living in a way that earns a salvation, that's where Christianity goes off the rails, and that's where workspace religion comes into play, and that is from the pit of hell itself. Amen. You cannot and will not ever earn your salvation. It can only be received by the grace of God himself, who extended us the gift of Jesus Christ, his son, and whom we receive, not because we earn or deserve it, but because we say, Lord, we know we can't do this. I receive your gift of salvation, and that's it. By faith, we receive salvation. And so today, before even thinking and pondering how the wind race before us, we need to humbly bow down before God and before Jesus Christ and ensure that we have our right position as Him as being our Lord and our Savior. Because once we understand that we receive Jesus as a free gift and the salvation through Him, then, as we seek to love Christ and say thank you to Christ for the salvation that he has given us freely, then all of a sudden our motivations are pure and our desires are right. Yeah. And so I have to add that disclaimer. No salvation, you cannot earn or deserve. There is no crown for salvation. Okay? It is something that Christ has purchased for us. Now as a response for salvation... Like I said, then we want to start winning the race because of what God has done. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 7, describes what our mindset should be that the imperishable permanence of these crowns in which we're about to talk about, which we receive and describe, should be, and we should be wanting to achieve these gifts that are out there for us to receive by working through and underneath Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Okay? It's a matter of receiving these things in response to obedience. 
And the whole point of this thing here is nothing more than encouragement. I want to encourage you with something new today. When we look at heaven, there's this, there's this misperception about what heaven is. Uh, you know, there's a lot who, who wonder, and I'm not going to... It's unfortunately one of the, the gals that I couldn't make it a big smile on her face. There was a debate and a question about what does heaven look like? What, what are we going to be doing? It's a valid question. Some will see it and just think that we're sitting up on clouds, floating around, playing the harps. We've all seen that, right? We've seen the harps that we're supposed to be, and it's lounge and lounge for eternity. But the simple fact is we know that that's not the case. There's not a single scripture, not a single scripture in the entire Bible that supports that view of us having nothing to do in heaven, sitting on a cloud, or cl clown, <laughs> sitting <laughs> on a cloud with wings. No, angels, they're the ones that supposedly have wings. And even that, I'm not too sure. I haven't seen a biblical scripture that, that shows angels as having wings. There is a lot of misperception. And we're going to talk about heaven in another sermon because that's something we need to have a clear view and understanding of what are we, why are we trying to achieve this destination? What does this destination look like? But the bottom line is, is that we need to understand that we need to be motivated to get there because once we get there, there's going to be some things that happen. We're going to receive some rewards and recognition by Jesus Christ himself for the race and the life we lived. And we should want that. This is a good thing to have Jesus Christ sitting there going, good job, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here is a crown for you because you kept the grace. You finished to the end. You never left me. You never abandoned me. You completed what you ought to have. And I, you know, I cannot wait to see that. Now, I don't live for that, but I want that. Is that, you know, is that a, does that make sense? That you don't live for a recognition from Jesus Christ, but you truly desire Jesus Christ to recognize you. That's a good point to have. Now, the debatable areas in this are, okay, when you read Scripture, that these crowns, some people would say, might be symbolic. <clears throat> I think that there is a case that can be made in Scripture that leaves room to go both directions. That these crowns may be symbolic, but there is also very clear language that could say that these crowns are very real. Here's my question to you. Does it really matter? <laughs> no. Does it really matter if they're real or symbolic? No, not really. Will you be disappointed when you get to heaven and you don't receive this physical crown or wreath? I truly doubt it. I don't think we're going to get up there and go, Jesus, where's my crown? <laughs> no, no, no. Does working for or desiring these rewards motivate you to pursue and worship and serve God more? If the answer is yes, what's wrong with that? If it makes you want to pursue God and to be more like Jesus, go for it. Earn those crowns because you're doing it for the right motivation and reason. You want to receive and you want to honor Jesus with your life. There's nothing wrong with that. Should you be desiring rewards from Jesus for life? Of course not. I just said that. We shouldn't be desiring, hey, Jesus, I live my life. Well, I want this from you. No. But should you be living your life to win? Yeah. Be competitive in this area. Don't let the enemy mess around anymore. No longer be content with just receiving and getting through this life and say, hey, I made it into heaven. Woohoo! That's not enough. Just getting through the door is just the beginning of what we should be aiming for. There is so much more than getting through the door. There is an eternity of worshiping and serving and being with Jesus that comes after that. And we want to make sure that we live for so much more than just getting it. And the last bit of ground, background and support on this as I was studying this scripture, you know, if this had only came from Paul, if Paul was the only writer that ever talked about crowns, I'd be a bit more dubious about the, the description of these things. But when you read the Bible, James talked about them, Paul talked about them, Peter talked about them, and John wrote about crowns. Four different sources, four different writers. I think that Jesus wanted this thing to be clear that this is not, you know, these things are real. And when John was writing about them, guess whose words he was actually recording? Jesus. Jesus' words himself in Revelation talk about a crown. 
I think it's a safe bet that these are real, and we should be thinking and wondering about what they look like. So, as we move forward, let's go ahead and start talking about what these crowns are. Slide four, please. Now, what are these crowns? This is an important distinction. What do they look like? I think most people, when they think of crowns, think of a royal crown with the gold and the jewels and that they're a king or a prince or something, right? That's typically when you think of a crown, you think of a royal crown. These kinds, these crowns that are referred to in the Bible, every single time the word crown is used, it's the exact same word called Stephanos. And the Stephanos is this wreath that victors of athletic contests would receive during this time of the Bible. And so the crown or this wreath is not a crown of royalty where you lowered over somebody. Okay, I think that's a very important distinction. If you're trying to earn a crown that puts you in a position of authority, wrong deal. Right? But if you're trying to earn a crown or a wreath that is a symbol of a victory of an athletic contest, it changes the motivation you're wanting to receive something for being and winning or completing a task. Get the picture in your mind that when you receive these crowns, as we talk about in heaven, this isn't going to be a royal crown of position. It's going to be a crown of achievement for a job well done. Amen. Amen to that. Okay. So what are these crowns? There are four. There's actually, uh, if you look at scripture, some might say there's five, but I think the fifth one describes the imperishability of these crowns, the, the crown of imperishable, and I believe that that just describes that all of them are not going to be taken away, or they're not going to go away, that they are a permanent reward because of being in heaven. So there's four that I have identified through scripture. The first one comes from James chapter 1 verse 12. It says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life crown of life which God has promised to those who love them this is the one crown that's actually mentioned twice identical references this also comes in revelations 2 verse 10 do not fear what you're about to suffer behold the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested notice there's a common thread here and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you, this is Jesus, give you the crown of life. Identical phrases, both from Paul and from Jesus, talking about this crown of life. There's conditions that these things, in this case, the condition to earn this crown is to be enduring and steadfast and remain faithful to God through every one of the trials of our life that come upon us. That day-to-day -day challenges, the day-to-day -day stresses, the temptations that come our way, the trials and testings of God to grow and develop our faith and to keep our faith and trust in Him, all are meant for us to be faithful and to prove that we love and are completely dedicated to Jesus and God no matter what. That nothing's going to trip us up, nothing's going to keep us away from heaven, nothing's going to keep us away from our God, and we keep pressing through those and remain steadfast and remain faithful to God through them. And every time, and this is important I think to many of us, that when we face those challenges in life that are the hardest that God is saying, you are going to be rewarded for getting through this. You are going to be rewarded for your steadfastness. You're going to be rewarded for your faithfulness. Up until conditions that include death. All the way. This is not some small... You know, it includes getting through the simple test, but this could go all the way up to the you must die for the witness of Jesus Christ and remain steadfast and faithful to him. Every one of those things. And the crown, the crown description is this. It is a crown of life. There's no variations. I don't know what it is. It is the crown of life. It doesn't have any descriptive terms. It's just something that Jesus is going to... This is one that He is going to give us if we persevere. And I think that's the key phrase I want you to see. Keep pressing on. Keep faithful. Keep dedicated. And this crown of life will be presented to us up in heaven. What's it look like and when? I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> Just to see this fact that Jesus is going to say, 
You know, that this is a problem. To think that we receive something from Jesus Christ who died for our sins, we have no deserving of this, even if we did persevere. Simply getting into heaven should be enough and is enough for me. But at the same time, now that he's promised me this extra thing, I'm not going to reject it. I'm not going to, I want that. Right? But just the simple fact that Jesus is going to give something to me, I don't know. Can you imagine that? Can you literally see yourself down on your knee and <laughs> Our Savior, who died a gruesome death, coming with the nail-pierced hands, with the with all of the accolades and the He's God, and He comes up to you and puts this crown upon your head. What a day! What a picture! How could I ever possibly? I don't know. But you know what? I want to try. <laughs> right? I want to try. Yeah. What a beautiful day. What a picture it is. The crown of life. This is the one crown that is absolutely, I believe, one that has the least amount of questions as to its reality and its meaning. Win life. Live life to win God's grace, His favor, His reward He has for you. Live your life to win the crown of life. I encourage you. The second crown. The second crown is called the crown of exaltation or boasting. Isn't that weird? The crown of boasting. It's in it. In it. <laughs> This is one of those things that's in every good sense of the word about being prideful and boasting. So let's go to the scripture and you'll understand what I'm talking about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 18 or 19 and 20. It says, For those who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. This is Paul talking to his believers. And those people whose he's had an effect in their life. He goes, who is my hope or joy or crown? Is it not you? For me, when I get to heaven, when I talk about this, if I were to make this thing personal, who is my crown of joy? Who am I going to boast the most about? Who am I going to be most proud of when I get to heaven? It's everybody who is up there because I help them. In some smallest of ways. Loving that person on the street who is in time of need and giving them the love that actually demonstrated Jesus to their life and changed their life in such a way that they turned around from that and they accepted Christ as Lord and they're going to be up in heaven just because of a small little seed that I planted in their life, whatever it might have been. Or the people that you pour all your heart and mind and soul into and just you pray for them on a constant basis and they come to Christ and they be, they're saved and they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because of your prayers. They are going to be your boasting. They're going to say, Jesus, look at all, you know, these people are here because of you and you use me to help them. And they, I am so proud of these people back here. I am so loving and thank you for saving them. Thank you for using me, a broken vessel, to help I don't know. Can you imagine Billy Graham? Man. You could be sitting there going, look at all these people! You used me and they're all saved. You know, that's boasting. That's what that's it's about. I know Billy Graham. I, that's what he's going to be so proud of, is the people who responded because of his words and they saved and their lives were changed and God used him to reach them and beyond and beyond. It says very clear, when we face Jesus Christ, one of the proudest moments we will be able, we will see is the people in whom we influenced to eternal life. These people will serve as a crown of exaltation and boasting in the best of ways. You'll never know who this is. I have no idea who's behind me or who will be behind me. I don't know. I hope it includes everybody. I hope there's other people out there. I'm like, who are you? When did I have an impact in your life? And they'll say, you know when you did this? 
When you served at the Hope Center and you made that little package, well, that package changed my life and led me to Jesus Christ. And I am up here because you put a couple hours of service into a service and you've changed my life. How proud of a moment that's going to be for that Jesus used just those small moments to save somebody and bring them into heaven. This is an exciting crown. Again, I don't, know, I don't think this one is quite as physical, but it is equally, if not even more so, more important that we should be looking and trying to pour into people's lives in a way that we are having an impact so that they can be our crown of exaltation before Jesus Christ. We want to live our lives in such a way to have that impact. So, we've talked about the crown of life and the crown of exaltation or boasting, and now on to the next one is the crown of glory. This one's written down in 1 Peter <coughs> chapter 5, verse 4. Now, this one says, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is Peter again, very clear. When the chief shepherd, capital C, capital S, referring to Jesus Christ himself, when he appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Now, the context of this is seemingly addressed to pastors or elders who were supposedly leaders of the church. It's very specific in context in the wording itself. But when you take the principle that James, for instance, warns that few of you should choose to be teachers because you are going to be judged more strictly for those who teach are responsible for what we say. Lord, God help me. Uh, but you know what I'm saying. We, so that if there is an additional level of judgment that can come upon somebody who teaches, there's also an additional reward that seems to make sense. When you think of it contextually, this makes sense. So when you're out there and you're putting yourself on the line and teaching the youth group downstairs as they are, and you spend that few moments and you help out with the youth, you know, the, the, the children's ministry, or when you lead a Bible study in a class, or when, that, when you step up here and you, and, you, and you let God reveal something directly from you to those, and you are teaching and having an in people, impact in people's lives, and you're being so bold, when you say those things, you're putting yourself out there. There's a risk involved with it, but there's also a reward. Again, I don't know this, you know, what this really means, if it, if it only those certain crowns, but you know what, it doesn't matter. In great scheme of things, I don't, it, it shouldn't matter. The bottom line is we always want to be taking what God has done in us and trying to push that thing forward out there. Parents, every time you teach your child spiritual principles, you're doing the same role as this thing up here. I believe there's going to be a lot of crown of glory that God's going to say, you did a great job keeping my word and sharing it and teaching others with it. That's the motivation behind this. Be excited to be able to share and have an impact and train people up. Because, who knows, maybe you'll have that extra crown of glory that could be waiting for you up in heaven. I think it's something that should be exciting. It's exciting to think about. It's also scary as all get out. The fact that if you don't do it right, that you are going to be held accountable by God himself. That's also scary. So, uh, as James says, be careful. If you feel led, obey, but don't seek to you know, be a teacher because uh, it's a big responsibility in the kingdom of heaven. But I encourage you, seek it out. Let the Lord lead you. I never thought I'd be standing up here, but I just simply said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, and here we are. Now, this, as long as you keep saying, yes, Lord, and to your glory, yes, Lord, and to your glory, yes, Lord, and to your glory, he will use you in ways you never, ever thought possible. Okay, the next crown and the last crown that is clearly talked about is called the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. This comes from 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. It says, and this is Paul saying, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. 
and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This one actually seems to be the one that is most likely to be universal. This is an either pass, a go or no go. You either pass or fail this test because the crown of righteousness represents standing right before God. If the simple fact is, is that you make it all the way through and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because He is the only one, Jesus is the only one that can make us righteous. He's the only one that can clean our sins away. He's the only one that can purge away all those things that we've ever done and make us stand right before God Himself. I believe that when you look at this, is that you fight the good life, you live life, you finish the course, you keep the faith, do not quit, do not abandon Him, stay faithful that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior to the end, and that way, because I don't even want to go down this path. <laughs> Let's just simply say, I don't believe in the doctrine that always saved, once saved, always saved. I believe that we have the choice and the responsibility to remain in Jesus' hand. He will never let us go or fling us out of our hand, but by golly, I see a lot of people wiggling their way out of His hand the best they can. They take and say, yeah, thank you, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, then they don't live their life. I don't think they're in His hand. I believe that there are times in my own life that I have was once firmly in his hand and I had my head, feet, and torso halfway out of his hand. Thank God I never, I don't think I ever completely fell out in rejecting him and fighting against him and, and sliding and, and giving in to sin. But there are times where I wiggle my way and I had to say, oh, whoa, 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 get me back in there. Lord, I'm, get me back in your hand. I don't want to be out here. I want to be firmly in your hand. There's a choice. That we make, but once we accept Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, that we got to stay and keep Him as our Lord and Savior. Some people are out there blowing their minds up at me, but saying this. But I think there's enough scripture, that, and this one kind of almost hints at that that you got to be faithful to the end. That you got to keep staying in there. Just because you came forward when you were 16 years old and said, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. That you can't just live your life any way you want to, doing all the sinful things that you want to, and then expect to be in a good standing of the Lord Jesus at the end of your life. It's a day-by-day -day choice to remain and keep Him Lord, Savior, and the center of my life. And if we continue and we persevere, this crown of righteousness is something that we will receive. This one also seems very clear that way Paul talks about it. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is a beautiful promise. Another crown, another thing that we can earn by being consistent in Jesus. Now, Revelations 10, next slide, talks about this. It's something that we, I think, these crowns, let's kind of recap. I think it's something that we should be desiring, right? I hope you agree on this. That you should be achieving and want to receive all of these crowns, all of these recognitions, all of these things that the Lord has in store for you on top of just simply make it into heaven. We want to do that. But he also gives us a warning here in Revelations 3, 10 through 11. It says, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. And here's the whole phrase. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. This once again points to it's a constant, daily, moment-to-moment, -moment, continuing to abide in Jesus Christ's way that we get to hold on to these. I believe this is one of those things where you could, you could, don't, you've lived your life until a certain point, you got that crown right there, and then you flip, you flub up, and all of a sudden it's a little bit farther away, right? They think this is one of those things where there's a consistency. Jesus is saying, I am coming soon, but you need to hold on to this thing. Do not let your faith slip. Do not fall away from me. Continue to abide. Continue to stay. <coughs> this is one more aspect of the warning of that. These things are something to continually pursue every day of our life. 
and it helps us to be motivated. This helps us to do the course. It's not easy to just keep rejecting the world when it, the world's saying, just have, give up. Give in to your temptation. Give in to your feelings and your impulses. Just do it because you just, you'll feel better about yourself. You know, you'll feel better and you'll think better. And, oh, come on, you don't have to be set, set aside from the world. Have fun. And in God, we know that when, you know, those are have fun. They're some of the dangerous words in the world because, really, is it all that fun? What seems to be so exciting for such a short period, right after you give in to that temptation, then becomes the most vile tasting, the most regretful actions you've ever done in your life. Jesus wants us to persevere through the world's pressures and stay there. And so I ask you this question. Are you living your life to win? Are you living your life to win what God has? Or are you just wanting to make it through and get into the door of heaven by the skin of your teeth? I used to be, hey, you know, heaven was fine with me. I don't, I don't need anything else. But then I realized, going, I'm not living for enough. If living to get into heaven's your only goal, it is a shallow, easy, it's an easiest goal to achieve. All you got to do is, no, I shouldn't say that, but it's easy. To get into heaven is not a problem at all. Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. I accept you. I'm going to follow you all my days. Congratulations, you just made it through the door of heaven. But once you get up there, I think that if that's all you're looking for, you're going to be seriously disappointed that you didn't invest your life being more prepared, more trained, more ready to worship God in the greatest ways possible. I think there's going to be times where you're going to go, man, I had the opportunity to achieve even more for this kingdom. I could have had more people behind me with this crown of exaltation. I could have had this crown of righteousness. I could have achieved this, uh, what's the one we call the, the crown of glory when you had the opportunity to teach a class, but you passed it by. You know, there's going to be these things, and I don't want any regret. Now, again, some of you are saying there's going to be a regret in heaven. No, but you know what I mean, that you're going to say, I could have had one more. Has anybody ever seen a movie? And if you haven't, it's called uh, Heartbreak Ridge. Is that the one where that kid saves the people up on the top in, uh, in uh, World War II? Something like that, yeah. I'm trying to remember this. Basically, a, it's a war movie. It talks about this kid who was a uh, 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 conscientious objector, would not carry a gun, but he went into World War II in the Army as a medic. And they went into the, the worst parts of Iwo Jima. He did not have a gun, but he saved life after life after life. And as you went through and watched this movie, it, it was horribly gory, but it is at the same time so motivational. He kept praying to the Lord, Lord, give me just one more. Help me save one more. That was it. Over the night, he was the only person up there surrounded by Japanese forces with people dying. And he would save, and he would come down, and he'd lower him down a cliff by himself. It was amazing. And he'd constantly pray, give me one more, Lord, just one more. That is living to win it. We should have this exact same phrase. Lord, let me affect one more life. Lord, help me bring one more person into your kingdom. Lord, help me serve just one more person. Lord, I just want to do one more for you. Help me achieve that one more. If you need extra motivation outside of that, I've just given you some extra things to aim for. My daughter, she's a, she's a competitive little thing. And the one thing that we haven't done is challenge her enough. Well, sometimes we need to be challenged. I'm challenging you right now. What crowns do you know that you've received? Do you have confidence when you get to heaven that God's going to say, here you go. Here's your crown of life. If not, live and change. And right now, make it a motivational thing that I want to make sure I achieve that crown on top of everything else. Lord, I want to save one more because I want everything you have in store yes. for me. Yes. I want every blessing that you have. Don't hold a single, when I get to heaven, I do not want to look at a bucket of blessings that God had in store to give to me, but he couldn't give them to me because I didn't ask, or I wasn't brave enough to go out on a limb and live my life completely and without abandon. I don't want anything up there going, oh, I had this for you. Can you imagine it? You know, look at this blessing here, but you didn't ask for it. 
Nothing. I know I want my bucket empty. I want to make sure that I have done everything possible. When I get up there, it is good. No regrets. And Jesus is up there beaming from ear to ear. And it's just going to be so glorious. So Amen. glorious to know what the impact is that we and I have been destined to do. And remember in Ephesians, God himself says, I have prepared in advance those things, those good works. I have prepared them in advance for you to do for my kingdom. Live to make sure that you get them and that you've received all that God has in store. And so this week, I just pray before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be so much more motivated in my life. I don't want to just get through this world. I want to bust through this world. I want to see that finish line and that tape up there. And when you get through it, your chest is out and you, you've given it everything you can and you're breaking the ribbon and you have won the race. You have done and completed everything as God has in store for you. Live your life to win everything for Jesus.